This is a D6 Generation Pep, bite-sized content for a busy gamer. Sometimes featuring Craig, sometimes featuring Russ. Hey, what about me? Oh yeah, and sometimes featuring Rafe, ah, uh, Hollywood Granger. to another pip uh this one isn't really a uh a, a, a hot take so much as a slow burn i want to introduce everybody to uh joe mccullough who is uh famous of course for Frostgrave and uh star grave and uh rangers of shadow deep my latest uh interest and passion in gaming and painting and whatnot and um, we've we've talked about his games a lot over the years, but we've never had him on. So, Joe, thank you for coming on the show. No problem. Good to be so, here. Uh, uh, first, we're gonna we 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 do have a question that we ask all first timers on the show. Um, all right. Joe, have you now or ev- have you ever been a gamer? <laughs> uh, in in the. I, I've always considered myself a gamer. Um, I know that that term has slightly changed in meaning over my life. It has. Uh, when when I was young, that meant you know someone who played role playing games. Yeah. Um, which you know I did, and now it tends to be more people who play video games, which which I don't really. But um, I'm in so, the same. But I still think of myself as a gamer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll use the term in old school. Part All righty. So definitely. how did you how did you first get into gaming as we define it? Um, I've got a I've got sort of conflicting memories on on how it all began. I've got two memories, and I can't remember which one actually occurred first. So either I was uh, I went to a bookstore that my mother worked at. We were picking her up one day and had a few minutes to kill, and I saw an issue of Dragon Magazine on the rack. And, you know, had absolutely no idea what any of this stuff was, but somehow knew it was for me. So um, <laughs> begged, begged my parents to buy it, uh, which they did. And um, that one thing led to another. But I've also got a memory of buying the, the Red Box D&D set at a uh, garage sale, essentially, um, <laughs> And then getting really into it that way. And I can't remember which of those two occurred first. Um, so. <laughs> well, it's, but, they're, they're both very, uh, very famous or very popular roots into the hobby, though. The Dragon Magazine absolutely. covers were some of the most amazing artwork that people that were interested in the stuff that sort of drew, drew you, people like you and I uh, would have found. And that red box features prominently <laughs> in... In many a gamer and designer origin story. <laughs> so was uh, anyway, it? Was I it, both of them. So. Yeah, <laughs> and absolutely to this day. Uh, have was it? How long was it? Uh, were you playing D anD D before you sort of branched out into other avenues? Um, so I was, I was probably only like nine or ten at the time oh. that either of these occurred, and and I fully admit that like I didn't really get it. You know, like right. I, I was too young and didn't have the the background to fully understand it, and yet I, I played it the only way I could figure out, which was like, you know, I went through the dungeons and I'd put up orcs and I'd go, "There's an orc," and I'd scratch an arrow off my character sheet and go, "He's dead." And <laughs> um, but uh, uh, amazingly, my my parents saw that I was quite into this, and um, so my father, who was a big uh, fan of Lord of the Rings went out and bought a uh, middle earth role-playing game. And, um, he figured out how to play it uh-huh. and he became my first game master and would run sessions for me and my little sister. <laughs> That's um, awesome. And then a couple of my friends got involved and, and that probably went on until I was 
you know, 13 or so. And then kind of by that point, my dad kind of faded into the background and let me and my friends kind of do it ourselves. Uh Um, And also, you know, that that prompted going to the local gaming store, which um, at that time was amazingly just about four blocks from my house. So I'd wander down there quite a lot. And um, they had a big used game section. So I would really dig around in that because it was usually all I could afford. Um, And that way, just kind of branched out into everything that was available at the time. Uh So I got into Car Wars and, and, and Battletech and... Oh, just all the, you know, I got into GURPS and, and you know, Champions and pretty much Call of Cthulhu, everything that was available at that time. And Wow, you know. that's that's quite a resume. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> quite an eclectic mix. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to try everything. So <laughs> was that was that like those uh, s- smaller games and Battletech and things like that? Was that where you first went into uh, miniatures? Um. No, also during that time, I guess from the gaming store. So I'd occasionally buy White Dwarf because again, I could uh, kind of I could afford the magazines. Yeah, um, and they had this this magazine White Dwarf, and I like again, I bought it without really any understanding of it whatsoever. Um, not just because of I didn't know what these games were, but because the British method of writing at the time was was quite different than than the American method, and um, but the artwork in those things was amazing and the ideas. And so I remember they advertised what was the first box of plastic Imperial guard. Oh, uh, yes. I got my, my local gaming store to order that for me. And uh, it took, it took weeks back then. <laughs> um, but eventually I got it and, you know, I put those things together and painted them and I, I still didn't have any actual rules. Um, so I just, by that point, I, I understood gaming well enough that I just kind of started to make up my own rules to play with my friends. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, my first my first real miniatures gaming was completely disorganized. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm sure well, some would say that's that's still evident in my games today. But uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> even if you had the rules back then, with the first box of plastic Imperial Guard, that would have been Rogue Trader, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, and I did eventually. So you're probably better off just playing with your own fr- <laughs> rules. Uh, yeah, I, I mean it's. Go ahead. It, well, I mean it's interesting because Rogue Trader, while while I didn't play it at at the time, I was getting into it, and then, and when it was the actual edition of 40k, I now look back at it and go, in some ways, that's the idea I'm trying to emulate in a lot of my games. Uh, not necessarily mechanically, obviously, but right. but that kind of free form, slightly more role play kind of style. Yeah, that actually. Now that you mention it, I do see. Uh, I I can see that DNA thread because yeah. it was much more of a storytelling game and uh, and much less of a competitive. It wasn't a, a competitive miniatures game no. at all in the <laughs> really trader era. So. Yeah, that actually that makes a lot that makes a lot of sense, uh, and 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 it presents us with an excellent segue. Okay. So <laughs> we go from the Dragon Magazine and the Red Box through the uh, a, a young man discovering himself in gaming, if you will, <laughs> and then um, what's the career path that leads you to where you are today? All right, it's it's pretty winding. Um, I would. So I, I went off to university at. Um, North Carolina Chapel Hill and um, really didn't take to it well at first, um, partly just being away from home. Uh, but but about a month in there, I discovered a, a, a store called Cerebral Hobbies, which was literally kind of a hole in the ground. You had to walk down a spiral staircase underneath kind of like a little mini mall. And it, the place was a pit. but. <laughs> But such a wonderful, wonderful pit, you know? <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's half the game stores in the world. Exactly. And over the next four years, like, I, I spent more time probably in that store than I did in my dorm. And, um, it, you know, eventually got a job there. But really, just just every day after class, that's where I was. And, you know, it, it was almost like – it was like going to Cheers, you know? Everybody knows your name, and you got this group of <laughs> – yeah. 
15, 20 guys that just kind of wander in and out all the time. And just whoever was there, we played whatever games we wanted to play. And since all the new games were coming out, we'd, you know, somebody buy the new game and we'd try it out. So again, this was just a huge part of, <laughs> mm. ironically, my education, um, you know, as I'm getting yeah. the kind of classical education, right. I'm also getting this, what I didn't realize was an intense gaming education at the same time. Uh-huh. Um, but eventually university ended and, um, you know, I decided to move on and um, wandered around a bit. Um, kind of at the time I thought I wanted to be a fiction writer. So I was doing a lot of work writing fiction, um, practicing, practicing the skill of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, but after I don't know, what four or five years of that, I'd had some kind of minor successes, but, but nothing really. And I was just a bit down on life. Um, huh. And so I decided I need a really big change. I need to just kind of get out of my rut and go, go somewhere else. And um, so I decided, you know what, I'll go back to school for, for creative writing. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to take it another step. I'm going to do it in another country. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'd done a like three week backpack tour around Europe, which, which only included Spain, France, and England. Uh, <laughs> And so I figured, well, I'll, I'll go back to, to the UK because, you know, they speak English and <laughs> that's all I speak. That that's plus. What I'm anyway. But um, then I decided, actually, why, why don't I try Wales? Because it's, it's a little more rugged and wild and kind of fits with the kind of sword and sorcery I want to write. Uh-huh. And um, so anyway, I applied and I, I got accepted to the University of Bangor, which um, is... For those that don't know, which is probably most people, Bangor uh-huh. is the, the only city in North Wales, and it wouldn't even qualify as a city by most standards. <laughs> uh, it's a teeny place. Uh-huh. And it has a small university that kind of dominates the town. Like the number of students is equal to the number of the regular population. <laughs> okay. Um, and it sits right next to the sea in the Isle of Anglesey, and it's very wet, gray. <laughs> place sounds ideal though mood wise well <laughs> it, it was as long as you're not uh you know too affected by atmosphere for you oh, that's true if you have that uh <laughs> that weather yeah, that weather psychological uh situation it, going it's it's not a place for seasonal defectiveness no that's it <laughs> it's a bit rough yeah um and and in truth so i went there and uh, it was an amazing voyage of discovery and I did a lot of great writing there and I completely fell out with the actual university in the course and, and ended up never completing it. Oh, um, interesting. But I, I, what, I also what happened? Had, do you mind, do you mind if I ask, um, like, was it a, your priority? Yeah, it, it was my, my advisor uh, just really obviously couldn't care less uh-huh. about me. And, um, he actually left halfway through my year to, to take a better job. Um, oh. <laughs> and I was like, well, that at least explained that. Yeah. Um, and part of it is just my, at the time, not understanding the UK kind of master's programs. Uh-huh. Like I got there and I, I basically had one class that was only vaguely related to writing. And I was kind of like, well, you know, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, like, right, right. They're not actually trying to teach me anything. Um, yeah. I realized now that's, that is the style of some master's courses in this country. They're very self-driven. Uh-huh. But um, so I started to think like, well, if that's the case, why didn't I just take all this money I'm spending and like rent a cabin in the woods and <laughs> just write for a year and right. yeah. doing this? And um and I think really I I no longer fully believe in the ability of universities to teach writing at a higher mm-hmm. level. Um I think once you've kind of gotten past an undergraduate level, you could probably what you could do is you can potentially work with someone one on one if you really appreciate their style or whatever. Right. But in in kind of a general thing, you're much better off doing it yourself and exploring your own voice and just right. practicing writing in, in different ways. So I, I think I would agree with that. Yeah. Right. So I kind of I got to the point where I was like, well, what is the point of this? You know, all I'm doing this for is what I now consider a somewhat worthless piece of paper. Right. Um, 
And at the same time, I met a girl, and I got much more interested in her than I got uh-huh. in sports or anything else. The um, age-old story. Exactly. And uh, eventually ended up marrying her. So going to the university was a win, even if I never got the uh, the degree. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> And uh, well, yeah, well, that and you, you'll, you, you'll never have to worry about thinking you wasted that time. Exactly. Exactly. Of course, yeah. the irony being we got married and then she still had a year to complete at university. So I ended up in Bangor for another year. Um, a, a truly miserable year because <laughs> I would, I would imagine at that point, because, <laughs> you know, for, at first I wasn't allowed to work because of visa stuff. And then even when I could work, um, a, it's an economically depressed place anyway, yeah. and I didn't speak Welsh, which actually most of the population actually speaks. They all speak yeah. English as well, but, you know, they speak Welsh right. themselves. Um, and so I'd get, like, temp jobs and offices, and people would call and speak to me in Welsh, and they'd be like, yeah, sorry, you, you called your own country, and I can't speak your language. This is really embarrassing. Um, but thankfully, that eventually ended, um, and she graduated. and. The kind of the next big chapter happened, uh-huh. which is since neither of us had anything specific to do after she graduated, we basically just said, you know what, we'll try to get jobs. And whoever gets the first job, that's where we'll go. Um, Sounds fair. So I, yeah. Looking around for jobs. And I got on the website of Osprey Publishing, who I previously knew as, you know, a military history publisher. Yep. That did lots of books, uh, lots of highly illustrated books that helped you paint miniatures. Yes. Um, oh, man, that'd be such a cool place to work. And um, they had a job for a production assistant. And so I applied for that and um, got the interview, went to the interview and um, realized I actually had no qualifications at all to work as a production assistant. But they hired me anyway. So, um, and that was um, very forward thinking of them. It, it, it really was. Uh, and, and that's the kind of company that Osprey was at the time. And I, I can't oversell how much I benefited from working there and how great they were to me personally. Uh-huh. And I ended up staying for, uh, nearly 15 years. Oh. Um, but but I bounced literally all over the company. So I only stayed in production for about two years. Um, and then I went to marketing and um, did a lot of, did a lot of different things in marketing. Um, and then I moved over to editorial and I did some editorial things. Wow. Um, and I was kind of part of what was the, the creation and rise of, of Osprey games. In, in my point, mostly from a marketing standpoint. Uh-huh. Um, and so then eventually I moved formally back to marketing to become the marketing guy for games um, at the same time that I'd, I'd uh, written Osprey. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> written Frostgrave. And, right. Um, oh, right, right, right. And, um, and that eventually led to my final job, which was as the War Games developer where I, I actually wrote some systems specifically for the company. So Oathmark and, and Silver Bayonet. Um, and I guess it's two years ago now that I've uh, left the company. I'd, I'd been working at home for a couple of years anyway. Uh, but uh-huh, right. I just thought, you know, I'm ready to strike out. I want that. I kind of want my full freedom. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well, let's, um, let's not jump though. To, uh, let's okay. not jump over <laughs> that. You just dropped the kernel right there. Okay. So Frostgrave. Yep. Um, were you? Did you develop that sort of on your own on the side, or did you develop that all along within Osprey? So it, it kind of Frostgrave rose out of a conversation between me and and Phil Smith, and and Phil at the time was an editor who had launched the Osprey War Games series, and this was before Osprey Games was kind of an independent entity. But it was kind of an idea of like, let's make war games in an Osprey style of, you know, it's a series. They're they're kind of small books yep. and, um, you know, follow a uniform pattern. But anyway, so I was talking to him and I was basically complaining about the fact that nobody had really written the war game for me. You uh-huh. know, nobody had written my perfect war game. And I, and I think he basically just got tired of listening to me and <laughs> um, basically said, you know what? You know, just go off and write your own. 
And, you know, if it's good enough, I'll publish it. (laughs) And and amazingly, despite the fact that I'd done a little bit of of role playing writing and I'd done a lot of fiction writing and by that point, even some nonfiction writing, I'd never really thought about writing a miniatures game. Uh But I but I got quite excited by the idea. Um, And I went off and wrote it and I wrote most of it during a two week holiday um, that me and my wife took to the Lake District. I would just get up early every morning and write and then we'd go do some nice walks in the mountains um and it's never been that easy again but um <laughs> it's kind of like have you tried it in the lakes region again <laughs> no i haven't actually to be fair but now i've also got kids so it wouldn't be the same kind of experience no no it wouldn't <laughs> no but it is a beautiful territory that might help it is it really is um but i think it was mainly just kind of like here is that lifetime of of gamer education that right that, you know, I've just built up over the years and it just kind of poured out. Sort of a perfect you know. storm. Yeah. And so that was a load of fun. And um and I showed it to Phil when when I got a manuscript done. And um he really liked it. And yeah, to his credit, he he took a at the time what was a quite a big punt on it because you know, Osprey had done these these Osprey war games, but he said, you know what, I think this is good enough. Let's Let's do it as a bigger hardback. Let's get some real nice art for it. Um, and so we did. And yep. um, and then because yeah. um, it's quite a yeah. departure from the uh, the early Osprey books, which are great. Uh, I mean, I have a bunch of those. I love them for like one off games and things like that. Mm-hmm. But Frostgrave to come out with such a big book, and then of course there were miniatures attached to it. Also, it's a much more fully realized. Um, ecosystem rather than the than like you said the osprey series of 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 slim game books so that was yeah yeah and it's not you know in retrospect it's easy to see that as kind of like that's osprey making its move to be a a big you know game player but that's just not really how it happened it was very piecemeal like i said i i wrote the game he decided to make a slightly bigger deal of it then we were talking to North Star because Osprey had worked with them previously on a couple of things and they got really excited about maybe doing some minis for it. And, you know, then they decided, hey, this might be that excuse we wanted to to do some plastic box sets, which we'd never done before. And uh-huh. so it just kind of snowballed. And, you know, so for me, it's you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of luck in any success story. Right. And um you know, that's that's a big part of mine. While I like to think I wrote a good game, there's also a lot of other people that took risks and put their talents in it. You know, getting yeah, getting Dimitri Burmack as the artist, the guy, had, you know, done some work on, on Pathfinder and stuff. And he brought a real just a real look and feel to the game that, that fit with it really well and really drew in the eye. And yeah. And then you got all the sculptors of the miniatures that got involved. So. It's fantastic. It's, it's, I love it. And, uh, and, and I'm unashamed uh, to admit, I actually am putting the finishing touches on the knoll box right now. Nice. Uh, for, uh, for, for my Rangers, uh, bad, I'm looking at it, all of the bad guys all laid out on my work table right over there. Um, yep. what is the, what was the sort of the, 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 the skeletal structure of Frostgrave? Because that sort of, that sort of DNA sort of carries through many of your other games. What was the sort of the the core mechanic or the core concept that you that you sort of fixed on that then everything else sort of fell on fell fell into place for? Um, when I when I first started working on Frostgrave, the real the real thing I was most interested in was was the spells. Um, uh-huh. Though that's you know, and because w- wizards had always been kind of tangential to most war games to that point, I wanted to put them front and center, and I and I wanted I wanted something that could really make games really distinct and different and wild. Um, so I came with a spell list. Yeah. Um, that said, I mean, so I literally wrote. The first edition of Frostgrave in the order it's presented in the book. Okay. So which mood makes sense? Follow the logic. Yeah, it's it's actually not what I do now most of the time, but but at that time, 
yeah, that's just kind of how it came out of my brain. So that's the way I put it. Yeah. In. Um, but I think what's what most people have kind of taken from it, and especially as it's evolved into other systems, is that kind of core combat mechanic. Um, right. You know, the opposed D twenty roll that's that's a bit different than than other opposed kind of rolls. Um, yeah. And that I I owe a great deal of debt, I think, to a game called Silent Death, um, which which doesn't use the same system at all, but but uses a system that I'd never seen in any other game up to that point, which was you rolled dice and this this die roll or these dice rolled together determined both your two hit and your damage uh-huh. at the same time. And I always thought that was just such a beautiful piece of game design because it it basically turned every two die rolls into one and, and right. sped up the game mightily. Yeah. Um, and I just thought, man, that's great. Um, now I went ahead and made it an opposed roll because I also think it's just more fun for both players to, to roll dice at the same time. And it gives, gives both players a feeling of agency. Um, right. So, and I, and I think that's what people have found is like, they always feel engaged. Um, and you know, it's very fast. Um, and a lot of people say it's swingy and there's, there's some truth to that. Um, not as much as I think some people think, but, but it's also something that I wanted. I wanted a more wild game than yeah. perhaps was common at the time because I wanted more, uh, cinematic moments and, and right. we get that through, through it or one way to get that is through increasing the, the randomness right. to a degree. What also har- that harkens back to that rogue trader aspect that we were talking about earlier as well, and uh, where a, a, a story driven format for gaming, what might not work for you know for competitive gaming, yeah. works more like you said with the cinematography and whatnot that you that your that your games create, and it's it I think some people may go into any miniature game, especially nowadays where they may have grown up with you know, uh, War Machine or, or, you know, Mm -hmm. any of the iterations of the Games Workshop games and think that every game has to be that way where it's going to be an even playing field across the board, (laughs) you know, and when they hit something that, that is more random, it may, it may go against their expectations. But for, for an old gamer like me, uh, I I love it. I think it's it's hilarious. I love the just to get into one little mechanic that when the, mm-hmm. when you're when you're shooting and the the shooter uses their shoot stat and the target uses their fight stat, it just gives me all kinds of cool little images in my head of do- ducking and dodging or <laughs> you know like Geralt of Rivia smacking a, a an arrow out of the out of the out of mid right. air and. And so I just, I think, um, I, I, I've heard the swingy charge. I've actually leveled it on occasion. If I'm a <laughs> victim of back in the original Frostgrave, where, a, where a, uh, you, you could take up to a, you know, 20 points of damage with one bad shot. Yeah. Uh, but, but with these, just the slight tweaks in the newer versions, um, the swinginess I think goes away a lot. And is mitigated by all the bonuses you can get. You can build, you know, yeah. you can mitigate your luck a lot depending on where you want to focus. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it, it uh, that has a lot to do with expectation and kind of letting go and realizing it's it's as much a shared role playing game as it is a miniatures game. Yeah, and I think that that also is one of the kind of key points in that when I wrote it, and and when I've written a lot of my games, I don't necessarily want these games to be about beating your opponent right they're, they're you know frostgrave is a game about grabbing treasure and yeah. um you know you quote win by by grabbing more than than your opponent but your opponent can still feel like they've won based on you know what happens um even to the point where one of the few editorial <laughs> changes that was asked for by phil when i turned it in was he said you realize you have absolutely no win mechanic in this game <laughs> i was like oh yeah so that i i inserted a brief note you know if you get more treasure you win but like i don't even really <laughs> believe that so you, know, like, you decide whether the outcome was good or bad and um which is great you know. yeah in the same way like you know some people are 
get confused because there's no moral uh, moral morale mechanic. Yeah. Um, and that's because it doesn't need one. If if you've played the game, you, you know the point at which your own morale breaks, and you go, you know what, right. we're leaving. You yeah. know, <laughs> and you can leave, which is great. Yeah. You can just go. That's it. You know. And uh, you know. so um, so that's that's interesting with the mechanics. And I'm, I want to come back to that in a second. I gave myself a little note. But what's also interesting to me for Frostgrave is how rich the background is and how interesting it is. And I know there's a Geek Nation Tours tour that features <laughs> a particular Eastern European city called the Frostgrave Tour. Um, yep. Where did the background for uh, for Frostgrave come from? Um, I mean... I hesitate to like really say it's this, it's that, you know, creativity yeah. doesn't really of work. Course, that of course, of course, you know, it's, it's all blended in your mind, yeah. but, um, but yeah, so there, there is one kind of thing that stood out when I, when I kind of went back and thought about it, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I think I was thinking about at the time, uh-huh. but now I think God, the influence must've been huge, which was um, a trip that me and my wife took to Tallinn, the the capital of Estonia, and um, which is kind of an amusing story in and of itself. Uh, yeah, I was looking for basically a Christmas present for my wife, who's who just loves to travel. Um, uh-huh. and so I said, I know, I'll just I'll get us a little a, a little trip to somewhere that she'd never expect, and um, and give her that. And um, and I think I just I saw a photograph online of the city of Tallinn, and it's got an amazing skyline because it's got you know city walls and and all these Russian churches and and it's just beautiful. Uh-huh. Um, but I'd never heard of the place, in all honesty. I you know if I had heard of the city of Tallinn before, I could not have told you it was in Estonia. And you know I, I even admit you know I'd had to look for a little bit to find Estonia on the map. Um, <laughs> But I said, "Hey, we're going." And um, then I then I got clever, and I thought, "And I'll make it Valentine's Day. That way, I can cover Christmas Ooh. and Valentine's Day at the same time." Very clever, brilliant, right? Totally brilliant. The only thing that wasn't brilliant about that was I had no concept of how far north Estonia is and what a Baltic country is like in the month of February. <laughs> oh, yes. Because it turns out that the Average temperature is negative 14 degrees Celsius. Um, (laughs) And it's dark a lot. Yeah, it was dark and it was really cold. Yeah. Um, But we got there uh, and it was touch and go with snowstorms and ice and stuff. But um, and it turned out to be an absolutely amazing trip, Uh, partly because there were no other tourists in the city. Like, you know, the city was very quiet <laughs> uh-huh. and um and snow fell the first day we got there and and stayed the entire time because it never got anywhere close to to zero um which meant you could go out and you could explore the city for about half an hour before you got absolutely numb and you had to go in somewhere and like have a coffee or check out a museum or <laughs> so we just spent yeah. You know, if if it had been clear, it had probably taken us one day to walk around this city because it's not very big. But um, because it was so cold and hard, it actually took us days to explore this city and it forced you to do all the things. Wonderful. So, yeah, and there's just there's all these kind of like I said, it's got massive city walls and it's got old towers and it's just and there it was covered in snow and ruins and and there's a couple other like there's there's a famous um alleyway basically just kind of brick alleyway that's that's half covered over and um they've taken these ancient tombstones and mounted them on the wall and of course they're written in i have no it's you know cyrillic of some sort and right so it just looks like these giant kind of like to me magic you know scrolls placed Uh up on this wall and it was just like wow this is this is magical and and there was another place where you had to take this this staircase down into some vaults, uh, you know, beneath the buildings, and an artist had his his workshop in there, 
and he, he painted kind of strange things. And I remember thinking, God, this is just like, this is where my wizard would be down in this workshop, you know, like this guy. And um, so, yeah, I think that was probably the number one influence for the setting. You know, yeah. It was that, that trip to Tallinn. Like I said, it wasn't kind of there in my mind, but looking back on it, I thought, yeah, that's, that's probably, probably the biggie. <laughs> well, I would, I, I mean, it fit, it sounds like you're describing the city uh, from the yeah. book. So you come I mean, that. Say, w- go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, because everything's, you know, quite Eastern European. I'd never been that far East in Europe too. So everything was just, you know, I, I went to the military history museum and all the armor is a little bit different and all the weapons are a little different than you're right. used to seeing. So it kind of, my brain of course, immediately goes, it's fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's history that you're just not used to, but yeah, that's fantasy to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's so that, I mean, that's that, that it, it seems to make perfect sense when you look back at it though, you, you want to yeah. create a game that puts the the sort of support characters from most fantasy stories front and center. You're in this frozen city, and it all kinds of makes sense. Yeah, yep, it uh, kind of works out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and it had to be successful enough that Osprey uh, enjoyed some success with it, and uh, and you went on to do additional um, additional variations, right? So what? What were what 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 was the like what was the the evolution of the game into those variations? Um, I mean, at first, when I first wrote it, I never thought I thought this is one and done. You know, I'm right. just having fun. Um, then um, when when it first kind of went up, uh, North Star did like their Nick Starter, which is kind of making fun of Kickstarter. <laughs> right. um, it wasn't it wasn't crowdsourcing. It was just a pre order campaign where you know if we got enough orders, you'd get special things. And yeah. it just exploded to a lo- level no one expected. Um, and immediately Phil was like, Hmm, we need, we need more. Like, you know, this, this book's going to do well. We need more. Um, and so he said, write more. And uh, so I just started writing more and yeah. Um, yeah. And um, so, yeah, I wrote a few, read it, wrote a few expansions and, and then, kind of wrote another couple of expansions and <laughs> it just kind of kept going. And, um, and he actually encouraged me, Phil, that is to, to write, to, to kind of do a new game in a new setting. Uh-huh. And, um, at first I kind of didn't really want to, um, cause I oh, thought, really, yeah, I just, I thought I don't really want to just rewrite the game into a new setting. Cause that's, cause my first thought was, that's just a new bestiary, you know, like yeah. if I just keep all the rules the same and, and make it in a desert, all I'm doing is, you know, putting in a few sand rules and, and putting in mummies, you know, right. <laughs> but, um, you know, I thought, you know, maybe that's a supplement. Um, uh-huh. but then like, of course he planted that seed in my, my brain and, um, as often happens, kind of a couple of ideas just started, working together and um you know i've also i've always been a huge fan of um kind of piratey adventure pulp adventure yeah um so i thought i was going to do another game i'd probably set it in you know some jungle islands with full of pirates and 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 such right um, and then i thought you know they're filled with dangers and dinosaurs and stuff and then i thought well why the heck would anybody be going to this place if it's that dangerous <laughs> um, and then i thought oh well they're searching for the fountain of youth you know that's why they did it right and then i thought and eh, not the fountain of youth that's you know but a fountain um <laughs> and at the same time i was kind of thinking like well how can i make such a game different from from frostgrave and i thought all right well maybe instead of having wizards front and center i can have something else and what's that something else well maybe they could be like low-level superheroes how did they become superheroes well, their their ancestors drank from this pool, and you know it all starts to kind of uh-huh. come together um, until yeah, you get the idea of the the heritors from the game are these kind of people whose ancestors drank from the pool and got these superpowers, and now several generation generations later, their powers have kind of watered down. Um, they're still powerful compared to normal people, but not compared to their ancestors. Um, and uh, meanwhile, this mysterious chain of islands that they found the original fountain from 
and that disappeared has reappeared. And so these people kind of feel this call to to go and find this fountain and and regain the powers that their ancestors had. Uh huh. Um, and once I had that idea, I thought, all oh, right, now I'm onto something. You know, now I've got an idea that's different and distinct from yep. Frostgrave, but can still use a lot of the core mechanics. Right. Um, and so and that's the birth of Ghost Archipelago. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> and that's the Ghost Archipelago. <laughs> that's is, okay. The chain of the chain of islands, which yeah, kind of comes and hangs out for a few years and then disappears completely for a few centuries. And um, yep. that's the Ghost Archipelago. And um so yeah, that gave me a chance to to play with with that new setting and in a new way and really tying the characters into the setting, perhaps even better than than in Frostgrave. Uh huh. And, and it also proved a really nice break, I think, for me from from the Frozen City. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> did did you do any to... research trips to uh, the Caribbean or whatnot? <laughs> I did not. Um, nah. like, you know, seems like well, a missed I a lot opportunity. Of pirate movies. Um, <laughs> next best thing exactly uh, you know i didn't i didn't realize the tax breaks at the time you know <laughs> i could claim this as an expense what the heck why am i doing, doing that yeah uh, <laughs> um and that i mean i i haven't been able to play Fra- uh ghost archipelago i mean a bunch of guys jumped into it after like right before covid actually um, right. So I'm looking forward to it. It didn't really hit my immediate area when when everybody's gaming groups shrunk to the size of their own homes. Um, <laughs> I had actually right at the right before everything shut down, uh, I had played my first game of Rangers of Shadow Deep with the okay. same guys who like uh, who who play a lot of Ghost Archipelago. So I'm I'm now that everything's back up and running, and I'm I'm full tilt into rangers i'm planning on trying to rope them into some ghost archipelago games too because i have all this pirate terrain (laughs) so i might as well make some use out of it but um have speaking of terrain if i can totally derail ourselves for a minute uh you and i are both friends with terrace cassidy from geek nation tours have you seen his ghost archipelago table he he has sent me some pictures and it is insane it is it is a beautiful piece (laughs) it's i mean of all the different things i've seen people you know take the opportunity of of the pandemic to you know when we were all sort of given all this time where we couldn't do much the the skills he taught himself to make that table look like a movie set is just in fact uh we just brought my son to uh to see the lost city the, the the new movie that just came out and yeah. I just kept thinking, oh my God, it's Terrace's table. <laughs> the last, the last big scene, the last big action piece takes place in a bunch of waterfalls, and I was just like, oh my God, right. I, I, yeah. I know, I, I know a guy who could make that. <laughs> um, but anyway, so, um, so, so Ghost Archipelago like sort of takes the basic mechanics and changes the setting and the background and the characters and. Um, give us a couple examples of superpowers that these heritors might have. Um, all right. So, uh, I think there's, I can't remember how many there are, but there, there's quite a few of them. But, uh-huh. and, and they can I, be things like, I assume uh, going by the spell, bo- the spell list yeah. <laughs> in, uh, in, in, uh, Frostgrave, I, I had to assume there would be a bunch, I would hope. Yeah. So, I mean, some of them are, you know, well. There's lots of different ones that, you know, you can breathe underwater, uh, you can throw people, you can, you can jump farther, you know, yeah. uh, increase your kind of critical hit possibilities. Uh, you can have hypnotic eyes. Uh, so it's kind of, yeah, a mix of uh, karate masters from movies and uh-huh. Jedi and, <laughs> you know. So is it when you build your heritor, are you like choosing us a a, 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 a a number of those to make a unique character as you yeah, do instead like of, Frostgrave instead or of having, Rangers? Yeah. Instead of having like the different schools of magic, like you do in Frostgrave here, you just literally have the list of powers and yeah. you can, you can kind of choose any ones you want and construct it. So you really can kind of construct your character that way and and kind of play to a theme more or 
or not as, as you choose. Uh, right. So it is, it's a little bit more open in, in character construction than, than Frostgrave is. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. cool. That's it. Sounds awesome. I can't. I, I'm doubling down on my intention of getting <laughs> getting the chance to play that. Um, so you got forced into that sort of. Um, yeah, were you so Were you forced cool. into pushing Frostgrave into space? Um. No, but mm-hmm. I was. That that actually comes more well. Once I realized that Frostgrave was a success success and you know yep. this is something I could potentially do again. Yeah, the idea of doing a, a sci-fi version was always there because uh-huh. you know, yeah. I love fantasy. I love sci-fi. Um <laughs> who doesn't? Those are what I play, you know? Yeah. So um but I, for a long time I just didn't feel ready to do it. Uh-huh. Um, and then actually like that's one where the the kind of fan base kind of kept it alive for me and people just kept calling for it and um and eventually i felt all right i'm there now well what happened was i ended up writing a second edition of frostgrave right um which we can talk about later but but it was really that that kind of when i'd finished that i thought okay like i really feel like i'm at a place where this with this system that i understand it intimately enough that I can take that and I can modify it to a futuristic setting and make that both familiar to, to players who play my previous games, but distinct enough that they're going to want to play that as a different game, you know, yeah. and not just a today we're going to play Frostgrave with laser pistols. It's, it is slightly right. different, you know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And um, that also, kind of came about as I was thinking about converting to full-time freelance. So it was, it was a good time. You know, I was like, this can be the big project that I focus on, you know, while I'm making that transition. Gotcha. Um, so when you say there, like what, what, what's one of the main changes that you made to bring it into uh Stargrave? Um, I mean, first off, one thing I didn't realize until I started working on it was just how, <laughs> how big actually everybody having laser pistols changes a game uh-huh. you know because cross grave you do have your guys with bows and you got your wizards can throw stuff but right but a lot of your guys can't shoot you know yeah. when when you play a game where everyone can shoot it really changes the tactics i would think yeah. to do. um at the same time I'd, I'd grown in confidence especially with like ghost archipelago Because in Ghost Archipelago, you have a Heritor, and then you have a Warden who's kind of like a low-level wizard sidekick. I I gained confidence in people can handle having two characters with distinct power sets. Uh Um, So in Stargrave, you have backgrounds, which are a little bit like wizard schools, though not as constricting. Um, And you get to choose a background for your captain and a background for your first mate. And then you choose the kind of powers within that. And they can be completely different from each other. Yeah. Um, so that you can have a a captain who's a, a veteran and all his powers are based on shooting, you know, and finding targets and, and stuff like that. And then you can have a first mate who's a mystic and does more kind of wizardly stuff or who's a robot master and assembles robots and uses them in special ways. Wow. And, um, you know, a bunch of other things really. Awesome. Um, but what it also meant, I guess, giving everybody guns was when I came to work on powers, you know, all of a sudden be, being able to throw a fireball isn't such a big deal in a <laughs> right. world where everyone can carry a grenade, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so it made me really rethink the powers and, and um, you know, what, what are they going to be good for and how are they going to change the game and keep it interesting? Um, and... Yeah, and so that that also led me to kind of whereas in Frostgrave you have treasure tokens, in Stargrave you have loot tokens, and these can be of two different types. They can either be physical or or data, uh-huh. so that you get this kind of yeah we we're, we're happy to go in and try to you know steal the box full of weapons, but we're also able to go in and download the Death Star plans and um, <laughs> right, and so different characters can do that to to different levels and have different ways of modifying all that, and uh-huh. so there's some nice variation in that. Um, so, and of course, 
the the game has more intricate not intricate but it, it has a few new rules that that go with shooting mechanics and and people getting stunned and and kind of reactions getting shot at that that keep the game moving in a different way and gotcha. um, so so yeah I, like i said I, I think it's different enough that people will want to play both and not just consider them right. sub- a complete substitute for yeah. each other and that was right. that was one of the main goals yeah and uh so did you wrote that before or after you wrote that after the stargrave second edi- or frostgrave second edition yeah and so, yeah, what, so was, think, what were the big changes for that for the second edition um i mean there there weren't any huge changes because i didn't want there to be um first off because you know people liked the game so i didn't want to break it right but um but also because I wanted, I really wanted all the books you'd bought, apart from your Corval book, obviously, to still be usable. I didn't want to just like, ah, oh, you have to start over now. Um, and plus, you know, I'd have what I thought was some great material and I didn't want to just uh, kill it. But um, so it was really a process of carefully combing through every rule of the game and saying, is this the best it can be? Is there a way I can change this to make the game more fun right. or more balanced. Um, and the first one being more important than the second. So yeah, more balanced, but only if it doesn't make it less fun. Um, so like, so probably the big one there is like with the soldiers, you're, you're now limited in, there's two types of soldiers, regulars and specialists, and you can only have so many specialists uh-huh. um, and specialists include all your higher level fighters and, and all your kind of missile weapon troops. So you're limited yeah. You can't just take eight archers, um, which most people didn't do, but every so often somebody would, and it just doesn't make the game fun. Um, no, no, it doesn't. No. <laughs> Not that I've faced that or anything, but yeah. No, but um, so that was one. And then gotcha. the biggest thing was really probably going through the entire spell list and just making little tweaks to some spells and big tweaks to a few spells, basically looking at all uh, all 80 of them and going, are all 80 of these really desirable? Because they weren't, you know, uh, probably about 15 of them just never really got played. Yeah. um, Because they just weren't attractive compared to the other ones you could get. So it was was really a chance to go through and say, you know, can I modify this spell to make it more attractive? If I can't, let's dump it and replace it with something that is more attractive. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, so... There was a lot of that. That's that's where I spent the majority of my time. Gotcha. Um, and then there's just a lot of little tweaks about, um, you know, in, in first edition, you've got spells that people have to make will rolls against the role you made to cast it, uh-huh. like mind control. But if you've got mind control at a five and so you roll a six, you've successfully cast the spell, but they're almost certainly going to resist it. So there's, right. there's rules about how, you know, there's, if you cast a spell, it's a minimum will roll of fourteen, and on the other end, you can't you can't just completely shoot up the um, you can't empower a spell like off the chart. There's there's uh-huh. a limit to how far you can empower a spell to make sure that the person always has a chance uh, at the other end to to kind of resist the right. will. Um, just to, yeah, things like things like that that they just make the game more fun. Yeah, you know, or yeah. keeping everybody a little little bit more involved. Um, yeah. And a little less swingy. Yes, it is, it does also make it a little less swingy. Yeah, to so those naysayers out there. <laughs> um, well, okay, so now we gotta now we gotta delve into some modern history, though. Hmm. So uh, you're working on Stargrave. You're starting to think about segueing into working for yourself and. Where does Rangers of Shadow Deep and we, and there's also we can't like we, I don't want to ignore uh, Silver Bayonet right but uh, I've written too many games this is this it, is part of my modern life but um <laughs> it gets it gets confusing um, it, it 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 just we don't want to I don't want to shortchange anybody's favorite right. Joe McCullough game is my um, so Rangers actually comes before oh um, okay. Stargrave and, and Frostgrave too, although it's it's had kind of a strange life. Um, yeah. So 
early on when I was doing um, Frostgrave, I created a little magazine called Spellcaster, which is like, I basically created a fanzine for my own game, which <laughs> is either arrogant or fun, depending on how you look at it. Uh-huh. Um, well, we'll say but, fun. Okay. I mean, basically, I, I had stuff I wanted to write for the game that just didn't really fit well into supplements because they were yeah. just little bits and pieces. Um, so, And I wanted some way to give that to people. Um, and I also just wanted – I wanted to experiment with self-publishing because um, I just – I like the idea of it. I've always kind of, even back when I was writing fiction, I'd produce little like copies for my friends and, yeah. and give them out. So I, I like creating books. Um, and at the same time, I discovered drive through RPG. Well, I didn't discover it then, but I kind of discovered it as a publisher then and realized actually this is a system I could use really well to, to help me do that. Um, right. So I did Spellcaster and, and found out actually, man, this makes this really quite easy. Um, to, to do uh-huh um and so i thought you know it'd be, it'd be fun to just kind of self-publish my own game um on on drive through yeah uh, and i but i thought well how am i going to do that because you know i can write a game but i can't i can't illustrate a game and i can't i can't graphic design a game so, yeah, right. so i i enlisted the help of, of a couple friends now luckily i just happened to have a high school friend who, who I gained with, who over the years has become an extraordinary artist. <laughs> nice. And, uh, More and serendipity on your side. Well, yes. Um, and so I went to him and said, look, I'm going to do this. It may be a complete and utter failure, but why don't we do it together? Because, um, you know, by this point, obviously I'd moved to the UK and he was still in the US and we hadn't lost touch, but I thought this is also just a great excuse for us to talk a lot. You know, yeah. give us so um so let's do this as a fun project together um and then i also recruited uh, another ex osprey guy uh steve meyer rasa is just a really talented graphic designer um and so kind of created my own little co-op uh to, to do this game um and and i had two things going on with with that one was I wanted to see if I could create a game that felt more like, well, that was a miniatures game on the table, but felt more like a role-playing game. Uh Um, And my first thought was that was it needs to be cooperative. Right. Because role-playing games in general are cooperative. It's about, you know, you guys going into the dungeon or doing whatever. Um, Then I thought, wow, that's, you know, not many people have tried a cooperative miniatures game. So this is kind of quite an entertaining challenge. Yep. Um, and also, I start. I'd, I'd realized already that, like, if you can do cooperative solo, is basically the same thing mechanically. Right. So, hey, great! I can present it as a solo and cooperative game. And at the same time, independent of that, I just had this idea of the Shadow Deep, which was just an evil area that kind of eight countries, yeah. <laughs> like literally. You know, I had this kind of vision of these these rangers standing on the edge of the earth and instead of like the ocean there's just rolling black cloud and that's Uh that's the shadow deep and it basically just eaten the country next door and they're just you know it's the big oh blank moment (laughs) (laughs) And and then i thought and then one day i was like hey i had to put these two ideas together you know that that shadow deep can be the the story behind right this game i'm writing yeah um and so I, I entered a, a really interesting, really fun period of kind of my professional life. So at that point, I was half I was working for Osprey kind of half my time uh-huh. uh, designing Oathmark, uh, which is a totally different type of game. You know, big mass battle fantasy, much more kind of mathematical and stuff. Yeah. So I do that one day and then literally the next day I would work on Rangers, you know, which is this very narrative driven tightly focused game and and, you know looking back i think i don't know how i didn't go insane kind of bouncing (laughs) between the two but but actually it was just such a time of creative outpouring um i had a a wonderful time doing Uh that um and um i actually finished the manuscript for for the game 
and I sent it to a couple of friends and, um, you know, most people said, Hey, it looks great. Um, but one of them as they uh, do. Ash, Bar- Ash Barker of, uh, Guerrilla Miniatures Games. Yep. He basically sent it back and said, this is really good, but I think it could be so much more. Oh yeah. And like, you know, I give him a lot of credit because that's that's not an easy thing to say to somebody. No. Um, and of course, at the moment, that's not really what I wanted to hear. You were supposed to just say it's amazing, you right. know. But um, but he really um, got me thinking about it again, and I, I was like, you know what? He's right. You know, I, I I haven't taken it quite as far as I could, and um, and actually, that came at an interesting time too. Because so I'd finished the basic game, and then I flew off on this big trip to. Adepticon, although it was kind of more confusing than that. It was kind of a road trip that ended at Adepticon. <laughs> and um, because flying from the UK and going to the US, uh-huh. every day I'd wake up at like three or four in the morning as as my body was trying to adjust to the thing. Yeah. And again, I'd, just, I'd get up and write because I had nothing else to do. Everybody was asleep. And um, and so I created Burning Light, which is the, the big campaign in the back of, of Rangers. Yeah where I think I really show like how far you can push this game that it, you know, cause in that one, obviously you well, not obviously, but if you read it, yeah, it's kind of map based and you're exploring this, this ruined, um, uh, nunnery. Convent. Yeah. Yeah. Convent's a better I mean, word. I, I can, I can never <laughs> come up with the word convent off the top of my head when I'm trying to explain. All right. I, I can never spell monastery. I'm always like, mon- <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so then that one, it's basically like each room is a different scenario, but you kind right. of control how you you wander through it, and you you search for clues. And it's in many ways, it's very much like a um, choose your own adventure played out, right? As as a group of miniature scenarios, um, and so yeah. Then when when I completed that, I thought, yes, that, now I've got it. You know, now it's. Now it's really something unique and different that, that yeah. hasn't been done before. Um, did did Ash like that version? He did. He did. He liked that one better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I yeah. must say that uh, to throw a little love in his direction, uh, I'm a big fan of his too. And I have watched every one of his Rangers videos as I was <laughs> painting my stuff and getting it ready to go. Yeah. So. And I mean, I, I honestly think his, his videos had a, huge effect on on Frostgrave, especially in the american north american market right um, whereas it's, it's much osprey is really good at you know or at the time was really quite prevalent in the uk but not nearly as well known in the, the u.s right um, so i think he made he had a big part of that but anyway so yeah so and i got barrett's art and i got my friend steve to to put it all together uh-huh. <laughs> and, and i sent steve one instruction i said you know, make it pretty, do whatever you want. Whatever you do, don't put the picture of the guy with the severed head on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sadly. And, and he comes back and he goes, all right, here's two covers for you. And here's the cover I think we should actually use. And of course, it's the one with the guy holding the severed head. And I Which is at, iconic. Like, why, what, what, what did you just think that well, was a little was just, too gruesome? I was just a little worried that like this might turn people off. I yeah. think it's too grim, you know. I don't know. It's just abstract enough, you know? Yeah, exactly. You gotta look I mean, yeah. at it a little bit before you realize he's holding a severed head. Yeah. And um but yeah, I mean he did such a you know, Barrett did such a great job of that piece of art and then Steve into turning that into the cover. And I, you know, I saw it and I was just like, All right, I was wrong. You were right. <laughs> that that's that's the cover we gotta go with. Um and um so yeah, we 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 put it out and um, yeah, it basically exploded. I, I had, yeah, I would think I didn't really have any kind of expectation for it at all. Um, yeah, you know, I had hopes, but it it very quickly surpassed all my hopes. <laughs> what well, it, it's and, a uh, fantastic a game. Um, now to just touch on one other thing that you had mentioned, you said when you wrote. The original Frostgrave, you wrote it in the order that it came in the book and that you don't do that anymore. So when right. you were writing uh, the, the rule book for Rangers, uh, how did you approach that that was different from, you know, in the order of the of the book's presentation? Um, 
Actually, that's a bad example because I think that probably is the one other one that I did actually <laughs> do in order. But, um, Let's take Oathmark. Okay. Mass so, fantasy battles. Actually. That way we've covered almost and we have, really haven't touched on Silver Bayonet yet. But <laughs> Now I I tend to jump around the book. So I, I basically create a word file for each chapter. Okay. Now. Yeah. And um, because I tend to go, I tend to, to set myself a goal of say a thousand words a day that I'm going to write. Mm-hmm. Um, but my imagination's not always kind of working in the same space. Uh, so, okay. So some days I'll have some good ideas and I'm like, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta write these monsters and I gotta get them down. Um, and other days, you know, I've, if, if I don't have anything, that's when I tend to go, all right, I'll work on core mechanics. Because <laughs> you know? there I just kind of got to grind through them and, and figure right. out. And, yeah. um, or like um, now, like if I'm writing scenarios, generally I map out the entire scenario in my head the day before, usually on a bike ride or a walk. Uh-huh. Um, and then I'll just sit down the next day and that's that's what I'll do that day is I will write that scenario. Um, yeah. But yeah, but then, but then I may not have one for the next day, so I'll you know go write some magic items or something. Right. Um, I, so yeah. it's more organic then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that makes sense. I mean, I think writing core rules, I do tend to it tends to go more in order than than say supplements do. Yeah, um, gotcha. I guess because uh, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I guess the core rules need to, to to hang together a little bit more than, yeah. than supplements. They can be right. a little more freeform, but, but yeah. Well, so. I, I've, I've had you for well over the amount of time that we had, uh, <laughs> that, that you, that you'd given me. So thank you uh, for that. But also before we go, um, what's the future hold for Joe McCullough? Ooh. Well, I've, I've already agreed to do too many things. So. Uh, of course. <laughs> sounds, sounds like that might be an ongoing problem. It is. Um, I mean, the problem is it's just a lot of fun. You do have a dream job. I can do that too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's also getting to the point where it's like, um, there's, there's so many games. I can't actually fully support them all to the level I'd like, but, um, right. but I mean, I, I have committed to, to, um, to more frost grave. I've committed to more star grave. I've committed to more silver bayonet. Um, I, I've also give, committed. Give me the thirty-second elevator pitch for Silver Bayonet. That way, we've covered it all. <laughs> so, Silver Bayonet is a miniature skirmish game in a world of Napoleonic Gothic. So, you assemble a little team of soldiers based on your nation. So, you might play the Brits, but you would draw your troops from from all over the army. So, you might have an artillerist and a a rifleman and a Highlander and you know and a doctor and. And there, there's even a few, like, you might even have an occultist or a monster hunter or, uh-huh. you know, if you're the Russians, a werebear or... Uh, As they do. Know, yes, a dampier or something like that. Um, and then you're, you you get sent on special missions uh, after recover artifacts or, you know, lost texts or to investigate reports of monsters and... Uh, as is the the want of these games somehow you always show up at the same time the enemy is also investigating the same thing so you you shoot it out with with the enemy while monsters are running around uh trying to kill you um sounds but it sounds cool to me it's different in in a bunch of ways from from my previous works one it uses just a completely different system than than frostgrave oh okay Um, it, it uses 2d10 um that's that's not because I think 2D10 is superior to, to D20, <laughs> but but can be used in different ways, and that, yeah. that's what attracted me to it. Um, so it's got some very different mechanics, right? Um, and and also the monsters are are potentially more deadly than they are in um, say Frostgrave. There's two. I mean, one of the core things is that most of these monsters, your higher level ones, can only be hurt by certain things, be uh-huh. that silver or fire or blessed weapons or something like that and and any time your your group is only carrying so many of each of those you know so that when the vampire shows up it's like, oh, who's got the silver you know <laughs> <laughs> right you need but you need you, the you right also, thing in the right place at the right time exactly but you also uncover clues as you're playing and some of those may be silver items to help you fight those monsters so uh-huh. it's, it's part investigation and, and part 
shooting at things and getting shot at. And um, that it's, sounds. I'm, I'm on. I'm on board. <laughs> It's 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 designed to be a small game, even even slightly smaller than than Frostgrave. You only have eight guys aside uh, uh-huh. in general, and um, it plays very quickly. And you know, but but it's, again, it, but it's different in that like all your guys do gain experience in it, though not quite as fast or as grandiosely as they do in say they say Frostgrave. Right. So it's it's much more. Uh, you have a unit. You know, you do have an officer who you create, but. But your unit story is is bigger. Um, Got so it's more focused on the unit than an individual. Yeah, unit. it's also a little more brutal in that sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that way, you can have people die. Exactly, exactly. That way, you can care when they die. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I care when everybody dies in these oh, games. Yeah, I'm glad. Really, even in second edition, where they don't cost anything to replace. <laughs> well, you know, Please, hey, get another one. <laughs> it's an emotional. It's an emotional stake. Right. Uh, that's what you get when you name them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and everybody has to. Absolutely. Well, that sounds awesome, Joe. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you get any 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 other last minute little hints of what's up? Like what's the, the next big thing that you can that you can mention on the horizon? Anything? Um I I'm hoping to take a break from writing new games for a while. Yeah. Um, though I never seem to be able to do that. Like we just put out the me and the guys just put out the new volume of Blaster Magazine, which or Blaster Anthology. If you haven't checked that out, um, so I've got a. And what's that? You hadn't mentioned that. No, sorry. So that's me and and Ash Barker and Mike Hutchinson who does Gaslands, uh, Joey McGuire who does This Is Not a Test, and Sean Sutter who does Relic Blade. Um, kind of all came together to do a co-op gaming anthology. Um, uh uh-huh. so Just kind of go. Here's oh, some cool, cool. stuff. You know, and it's like sub little it supplements and whatnot. Yeah, so I've got some kind of like Cthulhu stuff for for Frostgrave in there, um, and in the latest issue, I've got a full mini game called Death Ship One, which is just your squad of soldiers getting plucked out of time and dumped on this alien death ship, and you basically you have to fight your way through five rooms, and you probably won't, but that's the entire game. Is there's five rooms, save you survive. So, uh-huh. <laughs> Okay. Very cool. kind of gamer minimalist. So yeah. You just have your troops, some aliens, and then really all you need is like a set of blocks to kind of make walls and stuff. So, and and where do uh, where would somebody find Blaster? Is that on uh, Drive Through RPG? On, yeah, that's on Drive Through. Just look up Blaster. Uh, cool, cool. And so, uh, where if if people are looking for you other than Drive Through RPG and they want to know what the next big supplement yep. is or whatnot, where where can they go to find more info? Well, I have uh, actually just created a website this year, just josephamacullough.com. So pretty, pretty easy that's and easy to find. Yeah, partly as a marketing tool, partly just as just to keep track of my own stuff. Uh, yeah. Because as it starts to wander all over the place, it's just right. a yeah. way for me to go. These are all the pieces I've written for this game, and these are all the pieces I've written for this game. But but also, it's I use it for announcements. So um, oh, and that's the easiest place to check. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Joe. I really do appreciate all the time no uh, that, you, that you gave, me. and I can't wait to see what's next. And uh, yep. I, I actually have uh, I'm, I'm introducing a friend to Rangers of Shadow Deep on Thursday, and I'm going to have all these models painted up, and uh, we'll think of you as we're fighting our <laughs> way into the abandoned village and then surrounded. As the zombies are rolling twenties, yeah. <laughs> the zombies, the zombies have a horror, yeah. They have they have a way of uh, sticking around. <laughs> thank so, you very much thank you joe good luck in the future and uh talk to you soon yep bye-bye and that was the d6g oh. Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, 
you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.